uh, speaker, I would like to introduce Shen Batmaz, uh, who is a fellow Swiss student, but she was one of the leading activists in the first ever UK McDonald's strike that took place earlier this year. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you, yeah? Can I just like go sit up here? What can I say? I really need to go there. Okay. You're going to do it. You've got her. That is a really mind. I might just like put some questions out to the audience and take the pressure off of me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess, so on, on obviously September the 4th of this year, uh, McDonald's went on strike for the first time in British history in this country. Yay. Um, in the two stores, and um, I should probably introduce myself first, that's true, man. I'm from the Craven store in South East London, one of the stores that was right. Um, but the picket lines on both stores, if you looked at them, there was like a wide age range, but it was mostly like young and angry people. And it was migrant workers, it was workers from all kinds of backgrounds coming together to make sure that they were fighting in a group, in a union, to make sure things got better. And that was really important to me, that we were able to have so many different people on the picket line. I mean, we had workers from all over the world on our picket lines. We had Canadian workers, Romanian, Lithuanian. And we had one worker from uh, Papua New Guinea, I believe, and like all over the place. So it was, it was amazing. We had all these workers that come here, they're obviously working in low paid jobs. And this is the problem, is that all of those workers in those low paid jobs are really struggling to get by. I worked with one woman, she had suffered domestic abuse in the past, she was 24 years old, she had a four-year-old son, and um, she actually became my hero. She uh, was suffered domestic abuse, she came into work, we had a manager, like in most stores, like Lauren will tell you, she works in the Manchester McDonald's, um, and he came in and he started to bully people. And this was it, McDonald's worked on a culture of fear. That's how they work, that's how they get people to do things is through zero hours contracts, through bullying managers, they force people into positions where they are forced to work crazy long hours, where they're under the staff, but they can't complain, because if they complain, they lose their shifts. And this girl was bullied by a manager, she was screamed at and shouted at by a manager. But when she took him into the office and explained her history to him, he laughed in her face. And I, I think this really showcases the kind of people that McDonald's puts into management. And these are the kind of people that we're fighting against. Thank you. I haven't really said anything for three minutes, have I? I've just talked shit for three minutes. Um, <laughs> but these are the kind of people we're fighting against. And Stephanie, who is the 24-year-old girl who, who went in and explained her history and was treated that way, she became homeless with her four-year-old son because he decided to cut down her hours because she dared to speak up for herself, she dared to put in agreements. Her moment of power, her moment against him to show him that he didn't, he didn't affect her as much as he thought he did, that she was still strong enough to fight him. That was when she became the first official uh, striker in British history at McDonald's. She walked out at 12 o'clock exactly on the 4th of September, and she was the first person to do it. So that was her moment. Our work 
workplace. It was a union recognition deal that we wanted to make sure that every time they make a decision, we come to the table and we have a say in our workplaces and things that affect us. Um, so, how long do I have? <coughs> okay, I'm good for time. That's good because I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> so, that's what we were doing. We were fighting against this massive corporation. So, of course, the fight back against them needs to be international as well, which is something that's really important to us. We had help from the fight of 15 in America, we had help from United New Zealand, we had help from Swedish unions, from Norwegian unions. All across the world, we went out on an international day of action. We made sure we went out on the 4th of September because it was that. We wanted to make sure that McDonald's knew in any country they work in in the world, they're not safe from the workers who want what they deserve and who want something better from them. And you know, it's not much to ask for. When the company makes, I think, 22 billion in profit every year, and Steve Easterbrook, the CEO, earns 11.8 million a year. And he's the poorest person in his shop. I work alongside a 16 year old at £4.90 an hour. So Steve Eastbrook, I think it works out at something like eight grand an hour that Steve Eastbrook makes, compared to the £4.90 that someone like Nick, who works in my workplace, makes. And how are we allowing these massive gaps? How are we allowing someone to make so much profit that they can afford six yachts? Because in Watford, the franchise owner in Watford has six yachts. Why do you even need six yachts? That's <laughs> the question. But he was earning six yachts. He's got six yachts, but one of his workers is homeless. And it's only through fighting back that we can fight this. And it's not just in McDonald's. I keep going about McDonald's, but it's all across the world. There's loads of different... I will shut up, I will shut up in a sec. Uh, it's all across the world, all these different businesses, and McDonald's is the second biggest employer. So they set a floor for payment, they set a floor for treatment, and if we fight back, if we push up from the bottom, with all of the workers coming together to do that, McDonald's have to listen, not only do McDonald's have to listen, but all the other businesses in the UK and across the world have to listen, because in the end it's us who makes the profit for us, us profit for them, it's us that earns them their six yachts and their private jets, so why is it not us? who's able to afford to live, and why is it not us who are able to do these things? So, um, yeah, it's about coming together, it's about fighting back together and rising up together. I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, a woman who I personally find very inspiring, Moira Samuels, uh, from the Justice for Grandpa campaign. Moira. Hi everybody. Um, on the 14th of December, it will be six months since the fire at Grenfell. Now, I've spoken quite a bit about um, what happened on the night, and I don't really want to talk about it. what I want. I was reflecting actually on what I wanted to say today and thinking about whether six months is a long time or six months is a short time. And I think I want to sort of reflect on why six months is a long time in some ways and why six months is a short time in other ways. I think the community, lots of us, hundreds of us actually watched the fire on that night. And we've, our heart rate, I would say, has got to a sort of resting position where we are no longer in the fight or flight position. But what, where we are now, I think six months on, is a stage where we've reflected. We reflected very quickly in, the sh in terms of the shortness on some of the impact of Grenfell. What has been a short space of time, six months, for many in the community, is the bereaved families. Six months is not a long time to grieve for members of your family where you don't even have body parts to bury. Six months is not a long time for people who are actually suffering from post-traumatic stress. It's a very, very short time. But six months is a short time in which the, the community of North Kensington, and I think the, the communities right across the country, have suddenly woken up to the disgusting nature of neoliberalism. I think it's been exposed in a really, really vivid way in North Kensington. In particular, I think it's been exposed to younger people in our community. If anybody's seen Daniel's um, film 
um, failed, failed by the state, I would really recommend that you do. It's, it was made post Grenfell by younger people who at the time actually were shocked and horrified and who have now started to realise the extent to which um, we live in a rotten system. I think that actually people realised that neoliberalism was, is based on profit and not people. And there's been so many examples that have come to light. What's come to light is the fact that actually in a council that has 275 million reserves, that they actually made decisions to put up cladding on a building, which didn't really need cladding, to put up cladding, and to still make savings of 300,000. 300,000 pounds. Now you can make those savings if you say, well actually we don't have any money. But they didn't have any money. <coughs> so we realized that actually it's not just about cost cutting, but it's also ideological. And the ideological aspects that people have actually learned are the fact that working class people don't matter. The decisions that they make are about social cleansing. They are about meeting the needs of property development <coughs> and not local communities. That actually local people, we can shut down your services. Why should, why should we bother? And there are lots of examples of where in the community we've been fighting against the shutting down of services from our local library, which they actually rented to a private school, from actually shutting down a perfectly brilliant nursery five minutes from Grenfell, from shut the local council, the same individual who made those decisions about the 300,000 cost savings on cladding, bought the local college for 25 million without telling anybody on the council. So we now starting to actually realize very quickly that there's enormous range of corruption, sorry I can't call it anything else but corruption, that has been going on within the council. But also people have realized that it's not just our specifics and very unusual Tory council. You know, a Tory council that refers, actually makes statements like, the estate doesn't listen to the village. These are kind of arrogant Italians that actually have presided over the rotten borough of Kensington and Chelsea. But we've actually realized that actually it's not just the council, that it goes right up to state level. It goes up to state level with the fact that actually there was a fire in Lucknow a number of years ago, and the government, Gavin, Gavin Barr in particular, sat on that report and no lessons were learned. It goes up to state level because there was a loosening, some people call it the bonfire of regulations, safety regulations, which meant that Grenfell was allowed to happen. But that bonfire of regulations also <coughs> meant that actually the awakening, not just the North Kensington community, but the awakening and horror of the whole com communities across the country when they realized that actually those loosening of regulations in favor of landlords and not in ordinary <coughs> people has meant that Grenfell could happen in any community right across the country. So very quickly, North Kensington community and I think the country as a whole has awoken to the rotten system that we live in. We've also awoken, and I think some of us already knew, to the impact, we've been living through it, I think as Shen said, of austerity. You know, after the fire, there was such a paucity of services. We realised immediately the impact of cuts, whether it's been in the health service, whether it's been in housing offices, whether it's been in social services, so that actually ordinary people had to meet the needs. The volunteers, a whole range of volunteers have grown, have, have, have grown up in the community to provide the services, which really should have been provided by social services or housing offices, but they were cut to the bone. So, in particular, we've also realised the impact on Grenfell on the cuts to the fire service. Because people have been reading about what happened at Grenfell, a lot of the um, 
cuts to stations meant that it took a long time for, for um, um, fire engines to get there, the fact that they didn't have a proper ladder that had to come from Surrey to actually reach the floor, all those actually impacted the fact that they cut um, fire, very experienced fire um, officers who would have made safety checks, though they were cut and so we've had the impact of, Gren of Grenfell. But what's been very long for the community, this long six months, is the fact that over a hundred households are still living in hotels. And that's a bloody disgrace. That's an incredible disgrace. The disgrace that actually <coughs> is responsibility not just of the local council, but of the government, who should have intervened and who should have actually made a policy, made a strategy that meant that people are not expected to live in two bedrooms with their children, going to school and doing sharing beds and doing homework on beds. It's an absolute disgrace how people are expected to deal with their trauma living in hotels. And to that end, the Justice for Grenfell campaign are holding a demonstration on the 6th of December. 6th of December is the last council meeting of the year, and we say enough is enough. We need to get out there and be asking everybody to support us, support the, the community, the survivors and the evacuees who are living <coughs> in hotels, They've been living there, and are not, well, according to the council, going to be living there for another six months possibly, to actually demand that they actually develop a strategy, and whether that strategy be to take over the 1,600 empty properties in the borough and house those people who have gone through the trauma of Bradfield. So I ask for your support. Also, we have the inquiry that is going to begin. <coughs> Now very quickly, the survivors, if people are aware, the survivors who are in a group have now called for a petition. Justice for Grenfell have already said this from the off, that the inquiry is very likely to be a cover-up. The inquiry is not necessarily going to be robust or transparent. But the survivors have now um, um, formed a petition and are demanding from the government that actually they have community advisers, that actually they have no faith in the panel and the judge. So um, when the inquiry opens, we want people to actually be there to support the campaign, to actually demand that the truth be told, and that actually <coughs> the survivors and people who are impacted are able to engage in that inquiry effectively. Because I think, yet again, they're going to be sidelined. And finally, I would say, on the 14th, we have a silent march. People, some people may already have been on the silent march. Um, it's a very powerful march, it's unusual, because usually when you come and march as you're shouting. It's, we walk from Grenfell all around. Um, it's been growing, there are now, last time there was almost 2,000 people on the march. Um, this time around, we're hoping to actually bring, we've, last time we had the fire, fire brigades, the FBU union supporting us, this time around we hope to have lots of unions and we hope the students union will come along with your banners and support us. But most of all, I think we need to say enough is enough. It's time for us, all of us, whatever we're experiencing from uni universal cruelty, universal credit, to actually ridiculous pay, to actually rise up and actually say, we're not going to take this anymore. Well, good afternoon, comrades. And let me begin by saying it is a real pleasure to look out and see so many unfamiliar faces. I really hope that you have had a challenging but fulfilling day here today. And one thing that I hope that you will have all taken from the sessions that you've had today is just how centrally important we believe that the fight against racism, challenging and confronting racism, is to the fight against capitalism. We live in a deeply unequal society. You don't need me to tell you that. It's the reason I'm sure why all of you joined the Socialist Workers' Party, or if you're not yet a member, why hopefully you will be a member before you leave the building this afternoon. And as you will have discussed in the sessions that you've had earlier, in order to justify the inequality, the exploitation, in order to maintain the position that they have 
in our society, the rich and powerful, that tiny minority who own and control all of the resources, have to find ways of dividing the rest of us, dividing the people who work and create all of the wealth in society that they expropriate. And racism is, of course, one of the primary ways, one of the primary ways in which they seek to divide us in order to maintain their rule. It's not something that has been with us forever and a day. Those of you who went to Esme Chinara's session will have heard the discussion of the roots of racism in Islamophobia. It is something that is historically specific, something that was established with the birth and growth and development of capitalism. What does that tell us, therefore, that racism isn't somehow something that is knitted into the DNA of white people, something that can never be got rid of, can never be changed, can never be challenged. It's a product of capitalism. It has endured and adapted as capitalism has changed, as the needs of the ruling class to deflect attention away from the problems that they create, the misery that they create in people's lives persist, and as the the, you know, the seemingly intractable crisis, something that must have dominated the lives of most of you, uh, the economic crisis, for over a decade now, as that continues to take hold, it continues to grip, continues to dominate, so the bosses, the ruling class, need to use racism to divide us. Look at the way in which politicians have reacted across the world, and it's clear how central racism is. Let's just look over the course of the last year or so. In Austria, this time last year, the fascists of the Freedom Party came within a whisker of winning the presidency, and indeed they won seats in the elections this year. In France, this year, Marine Le Pen getting through to the runoff for the French presidency. In Germany, the, uh, the alternative for Deutschland, winning 94 seats in the place where Nazism happened. I'm sure some of you were on the trip to Auschwitz just last month. The place where 6 million Jews were sent to the gas chambers. 94 members of the alternative for Deutschland winning seats in Parliament. And let me pause there and say that you've got me. The substitute, the person who does most of the hard work in Stand Up to Racism and the Light Against Fascism, Wayman Bennett isn't here because he's in Hanover on a fantastic demonstration, against, a huge demonstration against the alternative for Deutschland. That's a measure of the opposition that is important and that needs to be built. And of course the United States, where Trump won the presidency with at the heart of his um, presidential campaign the pledge to build a wall to keep Mexicans out, they're all rapists and criminals as far as he was concerned, and the ban on Muslims entering the country. And of course, since his election, since his inauguration, what have we <coughs> seen? We've seen the disgraceful way he reacted to Charlottesville, equi e equivocated the behaviour of the fascists who murdered the anti-racist <coughs> behaviour with that of the, uh, the, the um, the anti-fascists who oppose them, saying that some of the people who were on that fascist demonstration were good men, and compare that to what he said to the American footballers taking a knee to protest against racist inequality. These people are sons of bitches. Who should, those, those were his words, sons of bitches who should be fired by the owners of those football teams. And now, this week, tweeting, retweeting, posts from Britain First, the fascist organisation. And that brings me on to Britain, because let's remind us that those words, Britain First, were the words that the Nazi Thomas Mayer, who murdered Joe Cox during the referendum campaign, used as he was carrying out that atrocity during the referendum. Uh, that was a referendum itself that was dominated by racism from both Size, both of the official Leave and rain campaign, uh, Remain campaigns. Many people argue that it was the vote to come out of the European Union that gave rise to a spike in racism. And it certainly was the case that there was a spike in racism in the aftermath of the referendum. <coughs> but it's certainly not the case 
that that was the origins of the rise in racism. We have seen a significant increase in racism in Britain in recent years. The Islamophobia that you will have discussed at Esme's session has been a dominant feature of British society since at least 2001 with the destruction of the Twin Towers. 2014, the European Union elections, UKIP, the racist populist party, came top of the poll here in Britain, winning the most seats in the European Parliament. And it was precisely because of that that David Cameron, remember him? The then Prime Minister called the referendum in the first place to undercut the support of UKIP and so on. And in 2015, that same David Cameron was talking about refugees at the time when that refugee crisis was really building up, calling the people a swarm, dehumanising them. His Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, describing refugees as a threat to the prosperity of Europe. And his then Home Secretary, Theresa May, whatever happened to her, was uh, both saying that she was determined to create a hostile atmosphere, a hostile atmosphere for illegal migrants, and also sending vans around to areas telling people that if you're an illegal migrant, get out of this country because we're coming for you. That was the atmosphere that they created in the years gone past. And it was at that general election, of course, that the then Labour leader, Ed Miliband, proudly produced a mug declaring that a Labour government would be tough on immigration. So in the face of all of that, our response is not to declare that since you know, capitalism is the problem, capitalism is the origins of racism, that what we need to do is simply concentrate on fighting capitalism, fighting for the revolution in the hope and expectation that when that glorious day comes, somehow racism will just magically disappear. On the contrary, we fight racism in the here and now. I wouldn't have joined the SWP 30 odd years ago. I'm sure those of you who joined around the question of racism would not have joined if you simply thought that our argument was let's wait for the revolution. No, we fight racism in the here and now. We fight it partly, of course, because it's a bad thing. Yeah. Probably not escaping notice that I'm a black guy. <laughs> Um, I hate the fact that simply because I am black, I am more likely, actually I'm not more likely, but you get the point, you're more likely to be excluded from school if you're black or Asian, minority ethnic, two minutes. You're more likely to, uh, to, to not go to the high-end universities. You're more likely to be stopped, searched, criminalised, incarcerated and so on. I hate racism because I think that people fleeing persecution, war and poverty should be welcomed and given homes that are welcome, not regarded as being a threat to our prosperity. I love living in a city where you have different languages, different foods, music, culture and so on. But in addition to fighting racism because it's a bad thing, we have to fight racism because we know that this glorious day will never come unless we fight racism. You think about it, probably, probably, the one phrase from the Communist Manifesto that I'm sure all of us know, uh, from, from Marx and Engels, is the phrase, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your trade. Why did they say that? They said that because they knew that workers cannot possibly achieve a revolution if they regard each other with suspicion and hostility. Think about it. How can you effectively fight and achieve your liberation if you regard Muslims as being a threat to our security and way of life? If you think that refugees are all bogus and that they come over here simply in order to scrounge benefits, occupy NHS beds and jump the social housing how can you achieve liberation if you think that European Union workers are taking all of the jobs 
and lowering racism. It cannot be done, can it? And that is precisely why for us, building, uh, building stand up to racism, fighting against racism is an absolutely central part of the work that we're doing. We have an incredibly proud history. And that, that's why we produced that book, Say It Out, in the first place, because we wanted to tell the, <coughs> the story of the fight against racism and the role that our organisation, the Socialist Workers' Party, has played within it, building the anti-Nazi League, building Unite Against Fascism, and now building Stand Up to Racism, carrying a, a huge amount of work out in the last few years. The march demonstrations that take place on United Nations Anti-Racism Day are a fixture in the calendar and the annual conferences that we have had in 2016 and, and 17 have been the biggest anti-racist conferences in British history. But we do not rest on our laurels. Those conferences aren't simply talking shops and not ends in themselves. The demonstrations aren't just an opportunity for us to get together and feel good about ourselves. But those of you who came to the conference would know that specific initiatives were announced. This month just got has been Islam Islamophobia Awareness Month, a whole number of events around the country. Just a couple of weeks ago, hopefully some of you will have gone on the Auschwitz trip commemorating and remembering and saying never again to the Holocaust. Uh, the next weekend, people will be going to Calais as part of the winter appeal to support refugees. Next month, January, is Holocaust Memorial Day, and in March there will be the next international anti-racist demonstration that stand up to racism and sister organisations around the world will be participating in. So far from simply waiting for the revolution, we fight racism in the here and now. But, and this is my point, <laughs> we do know that as long as capitalism exists, the ruling class will need to find ways to divide and rule, and that therefore they will reach for and play the racist card as one of those primary means. And that therefore is why, as well, Lewis will pick this up, as well as talking about the fight against racism, we must necessarily also argue about the need for revolution and seek to draw those people that we work with in anti-racist struggles in United Fronts like Stand Up to Racism and Unite Against Fascism towards us and towards an understanding of the need for a revolutionary transformation. The final speaker I'd like to introduce is Lewis Nielsen, who is a member of the SVP and a uh, member of the SVP student office. Um, Lewis. Well, look, comrades, a hundred years ago, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, the great German revolutionary, she said something that I think rings true today. Uh, what Rosa Luxemburg said is that society faces a choice. That society faces a choice from either going forwards to socialism or regressing backwards into barbarism. Now, tragically, uh, Rosa Luxemburg was proved quite correct. Uh, the great revolutionary wave that started with the Russian Revolution and swept through Europe Unfortunately, it didn't break through elsewhere. Uh, and as a result of that failure, barbar bar barbarism and barbarity ensued. Uh, not just the First World War, but what came later. Uh, the Great Financial Crash of 1929. Uh, World War II. The rise of fascism. All that culminated in the horrors of the Holocaust and their death camps of Auschwitz and Birkenhau. Now, we're not quite at that level. It's not quite at that pitch. But still, I do think that those words ring true today. Uh, we live in a world where a tiny elite, a tiny elite who control the wealth in society, are happy for the world to hurtle towards the abyss, to hurtle towards barbarity. Uh, think of the threats of nuclear war. The fact that nuclear war is a, is a bigger reality than it has certainly been in my lifetime and in generations before that. Um, think of the threat of climate change. The fact that the very existence of the planet and human life being able to survive on the planet is under threat. Uh, think about the rise of fascism, the rise of the racist forces that people have talked about around Europe. Think about the rampant inequality, the fact that eight men control as much wealth as 3.5 billion.
billion people in the world today. If society continues as it is, the barbarity that Rosa Luxemburg talks about could soon become a reality. Now, if this was the only part of the political picture, if this was the only uh, horizon on the political landscape, it would be quite a bleak one, in truth. But thankfully for us, the picture of that world, the picture of that barbarity, and the fact that ordinary people's lives have been made harder through austerity and cuts to living standards, means that more and more people are looking towards the opposite of that. They're looking towards socialist ideas, looking towards ideas to change society. Not the ideas of the right that blame migrants and Muslims and refugees, but to the ideas that, the, uh, that blame those at the top of society. And obviously the biggest form of this that we've seen is what's happened here with Corbyn. Uh, people have talked a lot about Jeremy Corbyn today, so I won't go too much into it, but it is quite remarkable, I think, to think that it was only six months ago that we were told that in the election, uh, Corbyn was going to get smashed, the left was going to be defeated, and that socialist ideas were going to be pro proven to be completely <coughs> unpopular in Britain. Uh, the opposite is the case. Socialist ideas are now quite popular in the UK. Uh, people look towards Corbyn, they identify what he says about ending austerity, about raising wages, about taxing the rich. This is incredibly positive. Uh, it's not just taking place in the UK either. Look around the world. Uh, the French election, that took place in May. Uh, Melenchon, uh, a left-wing candidate who put forward an anti-austerity left-wing vision, he almost got into the runoff. Uh, think about Bernie Sanders in the US. Uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign is long ended, but the Daily Mail ran a very interesting article a week ago where they were completely shocked that 44% uh, of all millennials in the USA would pre prefer to live under socialism rather than capitalism. That's a remarkable figure uh, in a land where liberal was considered a dirty word uh, 30 years ago. And you see, it's in that context of an increase in polarisation between left and right that I think we should have a think about what it means to be a socialist in the 21st century, about what it means to be a socialist today. Because you see, as, as inspiring as those examples are, of Corbyn, of Sanders, of Podemos and so on, as inspiring as they are, they all have a common feature. Uh, quite understandably, those examples really argue that to change the world, to go forward to socialism, we need to go through parliamentary means. Uh, we need to change it through Parliament, and we need to change it through parliamentary parties that, to be honest, at their best are represented by Corbyn, but at their worst are represented like the SPD in Germany, which has propped up Angela Merkel <coughs> for the last few years. And the basic premise, really, of all these uh, examples is that if we want to change society, we can take the current system, we can tinker with it, we can mould it a bit better, we can reform it a bit better, and therefore we can have a fairer, more just, and more equal society. And it's really the idea that we have to negotiate with those in power, that time <coughs> week that I talked about. So two weeks ago, uh, Jeremy Corbyn goes to the Chamber of British, British Industry, and he said that a Labour government would be a friend of big business, uh, that it would protect big, big, big business. Uh, two years ago, you saw what Syriza did when they were elected. They went to the European Union, they went to the Troika and they said that they were going to negotiate. They were going to get the best deal they could out of the Troika. Comrades, I want to argue that we have to go further than this. Um, not because we know best. Not because we're the chosen few. Uh, not because we scoff at Labour Party supporters as if they're stupid. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Uh, we share, with the people inspired by Corbyn, that vision of a different society. We share their anger at Grenfell, at the low pay in McDonald's, at the fact, uh, at the Tory sexual harassment scandals, we share all of that. <coughs> but really, comrades, we have to argue that if we want to get to that fairer society, we need a revolutionary transformation. And the logic of that is located in the fact that the system we live in can't be tinkered for the better. Uh, capitalist society, the logic of capitalism, cannot be altered, it can't be modified, it can't be moulded with a bit of socialism here and there to make it fairer. Actually, we have to argue that capitalist society cannot be pushed down a fairer path, and I'll tell you why. Uh, simultaneously, simultaneously this year, the UN released two figures. The first figure was that world hunger increased for the first time in 50 years. So for the first time in 50 years, more people go to bed hungry, malnourished, and not being able 
to access enough food. At the same time, the UN released another figure saying that global food waste accounted for a third of all food produced. So a third of all food that's produced in the world goes straight in the bin because people can't sell it, because the capitalists don't want to sell it, they want to keep their profits up. That demonstrates to me the barbarity of the system we live in. You can have a situation where in one part of the world there's too much food, so they throw it away, and in the other part of the world you have people starving. That is the barbarity of a system that puts profit before people and puts money before people's lives. And it's that barbarity that means we're heading towards disaster with climate change, yet we're burning fossil fuels at a higher level than ever before. And it means, it's that barbarity that means we live in an incredibly unequal world, while the Paradise Papers can reveal that 15% of all global wealth is stashed in offshore accounts. We live in a world <coughs> where that tiny elite I talked about will stop at nothing, stop at nothing to raise their profits and to raise their riches. And you see, I think, once you accept that, if we, want to, if we want to confront that barbarity, if we want to confront these people who are taking us down this path, we have to do more than just tinker around the edges of the system. We have to have a vision, like they did in Russia 100 years ago, of a different type of society, of a different kind of society. We have to have a vision of a revolutionary transformation of society. Not just where we'll raise the minimum wage by a few pounds every hour, but at where we'll abolish inequality, where people will not be forced to be exploited in their workplace. We have to have a vision of a society where we don't just get rid of the worst parts of sexism, like the harassment in Westminster, which we should of course do, but where we uproot the material basis for women's oppression. We have to have a vision of a society that where ordinary people have a democratic say in how it's run where it's not boardroom elites of mostly white men in boardrooms looking at the profits to decide how much is made, but where ordinary people have a say in how society is run and how society is produced. That is a revolutionary vision for how we can change society. Now, if we have a revolutionary vision, I think we have to talk about revolutionary organisation. We have to think, what do we mean by a revolutionary party and by revolutionary organisation? And I want to touch on one thing in particular that I think makes the Revolutionary Party unique. And that really is a combination between having the theory, having the ideas, and then putting them into practice, putting them into the activity. I think that makes a Revolutionary Party unique because I hope people have enjoyed today, I hope people have enjoyed engaging with the theory of asking the big political questions, and I hope people will feel inspired by it. I hope people will feel inspired to read more books on it, to go and do meetings in their local area, to take up the different arguments on campus, and so on. But the founder of the SWP, a guy called Tony Cliff, he said that theory alone is useless. Uh, but he also said that practice and activity alone is futile, is blind. We have to try and marry the big ideas about why racism exists, about how we get rid of sexism, about the power of the working class, we have to try and marry that into the activity that can make a difference in the here and now, the activity that can drive back racism, that can fight for a better society, that can fight for better workers' wages, and so on. And you see, that's why, to be honest, I'm delighted that we have Shen and Moira here today, because I think both of them, in their own way, I think show how a combination of theory and practice can mean that you can make a difference in the world around you. Uh, it is not possible to, uh, well, look, to lead the first uh, strike in the history in the UK uh, in McDonald's, you, of course, need to be a fantastic activist. You need to get up in those early mornings, you know, take on the bullion managers, organising the unorganised and so on. You also need a level of theory that says, actually, if we're going to get a minimum wage and a better minimum wage, it's not just about waiting for Corbyn, it's about workers' self-activity. Similarly, to set up a campaign around justice for Grenfell, you of course need to be a fantastically well-rooted activist in your local area, dealing with the sensitive sensitivities around the issue, but you also, as Moira said, <coughs> need to have that theory about why did Grenfell happen? After 30 years of neoliberalism, after years of austerity, it's the Tory council and the Tory government who are to blame. So it's fantastic to have both of them here today. And I think, if everyone leaves, today, leaves this room today, with an understanding that a commitment to both theory and practice 
is what makes the SWP punch <coughs> above our weight, then I think that would be a very good thing. Uh, often what people say about the SWP is that you guys are everywhere. Uh, you're everywhere. We've got placards, we've got posters. I think this is a good thing. I think this is something we should celebrate. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. And we should be proud that we were at the first McDonald's strike there in the early morning selling socialist worker. We were also there today when there was a demonstration at McDonald's where a Muslim woman was told she couldn't wear her hijab. We should be proud that any time there is a fight against injustice, the SWP is there. We should be quite proud of our history that Brian touched on. Uh, the fact that if it wasn't for the SWP, the EDL and uh, the BNP in Britain would be a much bigger force. Uh, what the SWP did in the 2000s and in the last 10 or so years to drive back the far right in Britain has, made, has had an impact on British society. Uh, what we did in the Stop the War movement to bring together the Muslim communities, the uh, trade unionists, students, to organise the biggest demonstration in British history, what the SWP made, did made a fantastic difference. So people should be proud of our legacy, but more importantly, I think people should be proud about what we're doing today. Everyone in this room should think of themselves as a leader in the fight against racism and in the anti-racist movement, but also in the fight for a better society. I hope people use the ideas of today to engage in them, but also to see what we can do in our local area. People should have a think about what we can do when we get back to our area to build the movements that I talked about, but also to build an organisation that can shape it. So, like people have said, uh, if you're not a member, you should think about joining us. And if you are a member, you should think about how you can make a difference where you are with your local SWP branch. And to finish, really, I want to <coughs> finish, like every good contribution finishes, um, by quoting something, else, uh, someone, something that was said by someone else. You said it probably a lot better than I can. Um, I want to quote someone... It's not Lenin, it's not Marx, uh, it's not even someone who probably called himself a Marxist. Um, the person that I want to quote is Martin Luther King. Uh, next year marks 50 years since King was assassinated. And I want to quote something that King said uh, on the night before he died. He gave a speech. Uh, he was in Memphis in Tennessee uh, supporting the sanitation workers who were on strike for better wages and conditions. And the night before he died, people should YouTube the full speech because uh, I'm not going to do it in the accent, but people should look about <laughs> what he said, and they should look at what he, he, he said. But the, the, the bit that I want to quote is this one. If I was asked if I could live at any time in history, I would pick the present. Now that's a strange statement to make, because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion is all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only, is, only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And you see, I think sometimes when you look at the situation in the world, the world can seem quite a dark place. But you see, I'm certain that the stars of struggle, the anti-racist movement, the strikes for better workers' wages, the fight for a better society, those stars will shine through. And I think everyone here should think about how they can play a lead in building those movements, <coughs> but also in building an organisation that can help shape them. Thank you.